Hi, everybody. How are you? I'm, I've done the, the presentation about innovation in healthcare now for a couple of years. And I was thinking that when I got back this year, it'd be so much better, but it's not. Um, the healthcare industry, as, I, as I'll say, has really been decimated by COVID and its remnants. It's not the disease, it's the personnel shortages and the dynamics of the industry that have been left with it. There's a lot to be fixed. There's a lot to be done. Um, but I, as, as Allison said, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I think everybody should be an entrepreneur. No one ever should go to work for a big company because when you go to work for a big company, you're living their dream. When you go to work for you, you're living your dream. And I think the most important characteristics about entrepreneurs is you have to have passion, integrity, courage, and resilience. You have to have the guts to get out and do that, to say, I'm going to do it in front of everybody. And people go, why don't you just get a job? You know, so, but, but it's fun. It's the only way to live your life. And I think um, it's for everyone, but it's especially for women because it gives you a lot of freedom. And um, women are just naturally good at balancing many things at the same time. So I think women are especially well suited to be entrepreneurs. And we'd like to see more of you out there. Unfortunately, when I started, there were very, very few. I'm glad to see there's more, but there's still not enough. Um, just a little bit about me. I've been clinically diagnosed as intense, which is a great thing also to be as an entrepreneur. And I'm from Pittsburgh. I have my undergraduate at down that street pit and at MBA at Tupper. When it wasn't Tepper, it was GSIA back then. But I, I love CMU. I, I just think you're all in a you're so fortunate to be here. And the friends I made decades ago are still my best friends today. And so that's the that's the other gift you'll get from Tepper. Um, so what MedRespond does is we actually use, we use a video to simulate a conversation with patients. So the patients feel like they're talking to a guide before they have their open heart surgery. And we've done that model with a, a few people and we were lucky enough to land a collaboration with the Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic is the number one cardiac surgery group in the world. And they've been that way for well over a decade. Um, they're, they're the best and they, they really know what they're doing and they're really committed to quality patient care. And we're lucky to have them as a, as a um, partner. What am I doing? And <clears throat> this is just a very brief video that I and I'm going to show you a little bit of, rather than try and get online and do a demo, uh, because I need, I need my technical assistance. <laughs> <laughs> it worked when we practiced. No, it didn't. Maybe we have to get out of the presentation yeah, mode. Let's start early. So let me go to 20. 20 in. Yeah, let's just, can I do that? Yeah, if you just give you it's it's a very short video, but it gives you an overview of what we do and how it works. Largely because we rely on the kind of solution that's always worked, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Hello, I'm Darian, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our interactive heart surgery program. No matter what type of surgery you need you can rest assured that you will have the best care possible at Cleveland Clinic. The kinds of conversations that establish relationships. Before we begin, are you feeling ready for surgery? It's entirely normal to feel nervous or down before having major surgery. Your interactive heart surgery program will help you be as comfortable as possible and to create the kind of conversations that get results with even the most complex surgical procedures, we engage the top subject matter experts. MedRespond has collaborated with Cleveland Clinic to develop the Interactive Heart Surgery Program, a cloud-based interactive program to educate patients and families about a specific surgery, procedure, or condition to help them manage their health. We have the data to prove that this approach works. 
the average patient engagement was 90 minutes. There was a 50% reduction in 30 day post discharge costs. Patient satisfaction scores rose 99%, and 100% of patients using the program reported an improved overall care experience. Our programs focus on what is important to patients while emphasizing those behaviors that lead to better outcomes. We cover a broad range of topics to make sure. So you can see we're basically creating a video bot to talk patients and their families. And you could do a lot of the same communication with a bot, but it's not as personal. And she doesn't say it's normal to be scared. So we're really using that more personal touch of this coach in what we do. And like an hour and a half average engagement per patient is really phenomenal. And we've, we're doing um, several ROI um, outcomes studies and they're all very very positive that this approach works when people know what they're going to expect and their family knows they can support them i had one uh, the head of surgery of one of the hospitals said when you told me they were on for 90 minutes i realized that people have been going into surgeries for decades with many many questions that just never got answered and that's true so now she's going to have to show me how to get back in but you so, so we've had success and we've been lucky enough to collaborate with the Cleveland Clinic. But what I want to tell you is it's a tough, tough, tough market. And um, so what's the big deal about healthcare? Why is it so important? It's because it's really big. It's 18.3% of the GDP of the United States. Three years ago, that was 17. So it's continuing to grow. Um, it's just a remarkable, uh, it's a lot of our money going there. Um, and when you look at it, the hospitals and the doctors are accounting for over half of the spending within that system. So this looks like a dream market when you look at just those Hmm. It is not advancing. It you can understand what's going on. If, you know, it's really identifiable. You can see, okay, I don't know what it you have all the data that you need in this industry. It's really a very transparent industry. It's all out there. There's everything you can know. CMS has data by hospital, by surgeon, by procedure. They have the cost data. It's all out there. So what's the problem? You know, it's a big problem. And it started with COVID and it keeps getting worse. Um, hospital expenses are skyrocketing. This is the per patient in, um the increase in hospital expenses per patient from 19 to 21, and it's in, it's grown 20% in total. And you can see what's contributing to that. Labor is up 20%, supplies are up 20, drugs are up far more than 20. And so what do most people do? They pass along their increase in costs, right? Well, this industry is stuck because they have long-term contracts. They can't go back and say, okay, CMS, that three-year contract, I want to double it right now. They just don't have that luxury, so they're stuck. Um, the federal budget um, bailed them out the first year of COVID and basically took them from severe losses that year to just about having the same kind of performance they did the year before, but the federal funding and the federal spending is not there any longer to supplement them. What's really the big problem after COVID is the hospital employment is down approximately 100,000 people from pre-pandemic. And th there's an increased reliance on contract staff. The contract personnel came in and really offered really far greater um, wages um, to nursing staff and, and they've jumped at it. So what used to be 4% of the labor is now up to 38% of the nursing budget is contracted out. And those contracted rates have grown over 200% in the last couple of years. So you have an environment, costs are going out of control and you don't have, you have a cap. 
on what you can do with it. Um, and there's really a huge imbalance because while the the providers, the hospitals are getting killed with the cost increases and the lack of breathing room, um, the insurance side, the payer side are making billion dollars in profits. And that's because during COVID people quit seeking care. So they didn't have as much expenses on a per member basis, but they didn't give the members a discount um, when their costs went down. So they've pocketed that difference and it's billions of dollars. And meanwhile, look what's happening. Those the insurers are having billions in net profits, the providers having billions in losses. It's just that imbalance is something that has to be addressed. And I think smart payers are recognizing that they can't succeed alone, that they need to figure out payment structures that take that, share the wealth and, and help reach out to um, providers who are drowning. If you have a device or a technology or a innovation that targets providers, it's a very tough market to be selling into. It's like selling water to a drowning man. They're just, I, I was speaking with someone of the head of innovation at a major clinic and said, we are so stretched just trying to tread water. It's so hard for us to even think about an innovation because an innovation of necessity means I'm, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to change. So it's going to be an increase in what I do. It's going to take my energy. It's the... I have to have apply energy to change and the system just doesn't have energy. But that same person, and this is a smart provider and a smart system said to me, there are people in healthcare though who recognize this is the time that innovation needs to happen. So as difficult as it is, we can't survive without innovation. So they're welcoming it. But as you go in with an innovation, you have to really, be careful about not increasing the burden of the healthcare team. I was uh, I was at a at another clinic. We were talking about well, if the clinicians use your system, will that increase their work? And they were telling me about a program they had that doctors had to set up emails and patients could send back emails. And it was this great system how patients were going to communicate with their doctors every day. But now doctors had a stack of hundreds of emails at the end of every day. And they, they pulled the plug. So just couldn't, you know, you're setting an expectation that patients are going to get an email response and doctors just can't do it. Um, so you really got to be, keep your eye on what's the impact of the workflow that you're going into with your, um, innovation. Plus there's a lot of other things that make healthcare difficult. It, it's a political football. Um, can you imagine if the cost of cars were something we, that changed based upon the majority in the Senate? I mean, our approach and outlook on healthcare is, is being decided by politicians and, and it's become a, a source to manipulate. It's crazy. The most vital thing we have to care for the, you know, the population is now manipulated by um, politics. It's responsible for lives. It's complex. It's regulated. And I'll talk a little bit about these. So it's it, the innovation can't jeopardize lives. We're under the Hippocratic Oath that says, above all, do no harm. And they, you know, when Tesla, Tesla just has a problem with the car, what did they do? How many cars did they recall? You don't have that luxury whenever you implement an innovation in healthcare. It's like, there's no such thing as a whoops, let's redo that um, heart transplant or that implant. They do, but... Um, the level of this, the, the level of risk and the level of harm is you have to prove that you're making it better and you have to improve efficiency. 
And one of the challenges if you are going into healthcare is how do you prove efficiency without implementing your system? And how do you implement your system if you have to have the proof first? So it's a little, you know, it's catch 22 and how you succeed there. The challenge is how do you prove it when you don't have the data? Problem is in this industry, believe it or not, interoperability is still a challenge. You have the claims data over there that tells how much gets paid, but that's not anywhere connected to the electronic health record that has exactly what was done. Um, now the electronic health records feeds the claims data, but it never goes back. And that loop is, is it, I used to work in the steel industry and, and now I realize the steel industry 20 years ago was 30 years ahead of the healthcare industry in terms of being able to identify its product. So it's, it's really, and the critical data is not coded. So you wanna see, I wanna compare is this outcome I'm improving the outcome. And then you find out doctors are putting key data in comment fields because they don't have the time and they don't, the electronic health record is too hard. Um, there's a lack of transparency about healthcare costs. I was talking to a physician one time and I said, um, what's the cost of this procedure? And he said, you, you wanna know what we charge for it. Cause I want you to know what we charge for it has nothing to do with the cost of the procedure. And it was like, wow. And he said, that's that's not what healthcare does. We charge what we can or we charge according to a table, but we're not really reflecting the costs of the system. And if you think of everything else you evaluate with analytics and everything you're taught, having reliable cost data that's transparent is really key to improvement. And, and, and it's not there. Um, hospital systems are complex. There's mergers and acquisitions that are creating complex organizations. You have several hospitals that get merged together and hundreds of practices, outpatient centers, then labs and clinics. And then you have the system level of lead leadership and then the hospital level of leadership. And sometimes each hospital has its own board and they're all in silos. So, there's five hospitals in a system and each has a chief cardiologist. Well, there's a, you know, there's a push in healthcare there has been for a um, decade to eliminate those silos and make um, so that, for example, the Cleveland Clinic, cardiology every in every hospital reports through cardiology. It, you know, but you won't, you'll still find many hospital systems where there's an ind independent fiefdom and those fiefdoms are very powerfully led by um, personalities and they like it the way it is. So it, it, that's hard. So you, how do you get into it? One of the challenges you have is who's the decision maker and how do you, how do they buy and how do you get into that? And it's not the same, no matter where, you know, where you go. It's very, it's very dependent upon the organization, but it's also dependent upon the personality of the people within that organization. Um, it's heavily, heavily regulated. You have to watch all of these issues, the FDA, JCO, legal requirements, the IRBs, confidentiality and HIPAA, data security, cybersecurity. Um, it, it takes a long time to work through each hospital system's security requirements. And it's very costly. Um, um, it's very costly to be able to have a system that meets these requirements and have all of the qualifications and certifications that are called to service this industry. So um, it's gonna, that takes time. And the reason they're so nervous about all those um, requirements is these violations are enormous. Um, on a per 50,000 per incident up to a half of one and a half million. Um, these are huge penalties and these are penalties that have been applied. It's not that these are out there and no one's ever been hit. People are hit. And you know, the you as a provider, you as a technology company could end up with these kinds of penalties for violating these rules and requirements. 
and malpractice is real. So a, a very innovative um, champion decides to take on your new technology for so surgical closures and brings it in. Well, they're afraid to do that because of these kinds of, um, here's malpractice is based upon, they're not based upon the required standard of care. They did something new. $62 million, $60 million, $30 million. These are because, these are the malpractices because someone did something new. So when people seem they're a little reluctant to adopt a new innovation, there's another reason. Um, it's a complex buying process. We are, as I said, the decisions are siloed. They have to go through different levels. There's many influencers. There's many gatekeepers. And from what I talk to with people who have been into the healthcare industry over the last 30 years, they said the power of the gatekeepers is one of the biggest changes they've seen in healthcare as an impediment to doing business with the system. And what they're talking about, it, the IT cybersecurity, um, you you don't get in to talk to anybody until the cybersecurity team says you're okay. And the cybersecurity, cyber I've seen it where the chief surgeon can't influence the timing of the cybersecurity team. It's like they're left, we'll see what the cybersecurity people say. We'll have to get on their schedule. We can't move forward until, it's like, really? That's who's running the, but it is. In many ways, the supply supply chain, I negotiated a contract with a major um, manufacturer. It took two years to get through the supply chain process. And that's incredible. I mean, in financing, if you were in another industry, you'd be getting through that in weeks. But this in this industry, the lead time on sales is just so long, 18 to 24 year, months. So just figure out how, that means you have to fund your operations through the development, through the testing, and through an 18 to 24 month sales cycle. So you have, because you're not going to get any revenue, a long time pre-revenue in this kind of an industry. It's, it's painful. There's evolving payment models. And if you're really lucky, you can find a way to position yourself attractively into this payment model. So some of the some of the indicate quality indicators will actually drive reimbursement. So if you have an innovation that impacts that quality indicator, you'll actually increase the reimbursement a provider will get. So imp important, don't start with your innovation, start with the quality indicators that increase revenue and see how you can match innovations to those. I, I, I think that's a, a, a very good strategy to um, pick where you're gonna land inside an industry like this. And as I said before, that, that the stress of the providers is, is palpable. When sometimes when I go in meetings, especially with chief nurses or some of the lead nurses, I feel like, I'm in a room full of people who are depressed and stressed and anxious. And I, they're really, it, it's, it's a tough environment. I, my heart goes out because these people are at the front line. And, and they're in a, getting their attention is very hard. And then you can also have naysayers who don't want to do it. I don't want this to increase my workload. I don't want my staff to have to worry about this and they can kill a process, and I've seen that happen. It's a complex system of payments. So you gotta figure out how long is it gonna take you to get paid. So once you get that in there, you have the contract, what's the standard payment terms and who, who's paying the bill? So lots of reasons to that, it, that it's difficult to do business within the healthcare industry. So I have to ask you, is anybody having a startup in healthcare right now? Or planning one? Ah, but, but what is your, what are you gonna do? We're still alive with the condition being Nice. 
kind of open look, kind of obvious that um, that caters really to hospital systems. Um, but yeah. Well, that's great. Are you partnering with anybody and in insider into the systems? No, yeah, uh, kind of just uh, form relationships right now. The uh, finding a strong partner and a champion and someone who can guide you in terms of what people are going to think of your product on the inside, sure. I think is really so important. And then to have that person open doors for you, if you can find that champion is really, that that is a, a good luck. Um, the one thing that I worry about over the next year is how are we going to address this imbalance? How can we take the excess profits from the payers and move it into the pockets of the big losses for the providers? And there are models where you can take your nutrition program and don't sell it to the hospital system, sell it to the providers. I'm sorry, sell it to the payers. And you do that by focusing on what quality indicators are you going to impact with your program? And then you, so you basically have the payer pay for the service to be delivered to the provider. And th that's, we're doing, we're having a lot of success with that kind of a model. So, so the key takeaway is target things that improve existing processes just to get the ease of adoption. Focus, make it easy to use. Don't take, don't increase people's workload. Make it less, make it automatically work for them. Um, and map it out for them. Don't expect them to figure out how they're going to input it in their workflow. You come with the answers. Well, this is an industry you really have to do your homework. You have to show them everything. You have to have all the details worked out before you go in the door. That's not a sale where you can say, let's sit down at the table together and work this through this. They don't have time. Um, make sure you understand the buying process and it's down to the customer level. Prepare for a long cycle means you need to have the funding because the most the, the most common, I, I always say, startups don't go out of business, they quit. They run out of money and then they run out of energy and they run out of heart. And you have to just keep going and going and going and work hard at it, but be prepared for a long, long haul and never give up. Because as Babe Ruth says, it's hard to beat a person who never gets up. So that's um, that's what I have to say about healthcare. And as much as I've said that causes, I, I say it to you to keep you armed, to, but to not turn you away from it because no industry needs innovation more than healthcare right now. So I don't know if you have any questions or... We have one comment online. Um, we have somebody that collaborates with healthcare startups. And they said that many of the healthcare startups are struggling to find investors for pilots to know. Any suggestions? Um, I just was looking at the Silicon Valley Bank website, and I'll, I'll put the link on the, um, I'll give the, li the link to Allison. And they had an analysis of what's going on in. Um, in early stage investment in healthcare startups. And what they said is a lot of the investment dollars got pulled back because in this existing investments weren't performing. So they had to take the money planned for new investment and move it into the, their existing portfolio companies. But they saw that that was beginning to loosen up. I'll send a link because there's an analysis done by them about what's going on in the market. But you all know tech investing is down right now and it's hitting everybody. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it, it, that's a hard one. I, I wish the money were chasing this. It's, um, but I, I think the, the Silicon Valley Bank that presentation was a cause for had lots of cause for optimism in it, and I think they they have a white paper with it that might be a good resource. I'll share it with you, Allison.
There was a slide from the slides that you were discussing profits and losses. Um, do you have any insight on the losses and like what we did for some of the losses? Again, too. Um, the, it, it really is the the increase in costs at the hospital level. Um, that staffing, the, the, the staffing costs are up 20%. Oh, I'm rounding because I don't like to play with numbers like 19.1. But half of a hospital system costs are labor. So when half of your costs are up 20% and you have no pricing flexibility because you're in long-term contracts, it's going to kill you. And, uh, but also look at the drugs. The drugs pricing went up 36%. So. Is this like the highest that it's been? Historically, something that's cyclical. The, the, what's going on in the staffing within the healthcare, I'd say, is highest it's ever been. So the worst case it's ever been. Um, and, and you're just looking at the numbers. I can't. This isn't um, sustainable. It's not well, and we're starting to see consolidation you see all of the payers are consolidating because they have all this money on their books now they can acquire people easily um you're going to have the consolidation amongst the payers soon um and and those so all that's bad news except for innovators because those changes are the are the seeds where innovation can take place but you know it also it's i'm not gonna it's a challenge it's a challenge but I, I, from my experience, the most successful things we've done are when we collaborated with industry champions. And um, not everybody is going to be a, a candidate for your champion. You really have to find someone who believes in change and who's committed to that. And not every person is. So, you know, you can't knock on every door and expect it that you're going to land and find your um champion you're gonna have to find the innovator and, and they'll help you they'll help you yes yeah you were alluding to my question earlier about the increasing consolidation in the industry do you think that makes it more challenging for innovators to work with these big health groups as they get bigger or and also do you think it would be easier for an innovator to work with a hospital site versus the system level or just what have you seen in um, trying trying to sell to the, the the huge organizations is incredibly difficult. I think um, starting at a regional hospital, starting at a, a, a finding an innovator at a regional hospital to prove your um, get your proof, and then, but you know, and I. I even then, you're going to go, well, that's just a regional hospital. That'll never work in our system. Um, but but that you've got to get in the door, and you'll get in the door faster at a regional center, with, and you'll find an innovator more likely at that level. Um, the, the, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try selling to the big ones first. The, yeah. I wish I could say, you, you might get lucky. You might find sometimes... You know how we got into the Cleveland Clinic? There was a capital innovation contest in Cleveland. And we submitted and did a, a submission to the innovation contest, which we had to go and present against 200 companies globally. And we got first prize. And first prize was an entree to Cleveland Clinic. So sometimes those are, and I know... I met one organization that did nothing but their whole strategy was to submit in comp comp you know, competitions like that. Like, I mean, they were doing 10 a week. I think that's a little, they ended up going out of business 
because you have to have a business <laughs> beyond competing in competitions. But I think strategically placed and getting in those at the right time, um, and I'll, I'm really embarrassed to say this, we entered one of those competitions and at the end, I had one of the judges came up to me and said, you should have read the rules a little bit better because you violated one of the rules of the thing. And if you hadn't violated it, you would have won. It's like, ouch. So the rules matter on those things. Read the, read the fine print is what my advice to you was. So, But fortunately, I learned and I, I read the rules on the Cleveland Clinic competition. <laughs> Thank you. We have an online question. Um, what is your perspective growing access through providers marketplace such as the wheel? I, I don't know enough about that. Comment on that. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if I'll send you, if, if you could explain to me more what who they are, I haven't really experienced them. So I, I'll be happy to, you can share my email with people and if they have any questions for follow-up or anything. I'm happy to connect offline, but mainly it's a provider marketplace where they're basically growing access to doctors through telehealth. They basically pay directly to the doctors and then grow the access through telehealth to patients and other services. So it's basically just trying to grow access by enhancing telehealth. Um, I think I think there's another one where they're trying. Is this a model where you pay this organization to get in front of their clients or their members? Basically, doctors sign up to this because of the flexibility of time they provide their services, and then patients can be on the other side. It, same happens, for example, for better help on therapy and those type of models. Yeah. I, I it, anything that you can get you right in front of your audience, I think is a good outreach. Although I know there's some of them and I'm not going to mention where they charge you $3,500 to come to the meeting and they guarantee they'll set up four meetings for you. Um, so it all, you know, do your homework, look at those, look at the reviews of them because for the people who are not doing it and giving results to their clients, you'll see it in the reviews of that company very easily. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? I just, I, I want to thank you all today and I want to wish you all the best luck in the world and enjoy the friends you've met at Tepper and, and keep them for the rest of your life and go in business together and uh, conquer the world and fix this. Thank you.